Uh, my name is Doug Stokes, and uh, I, I am very happy to uh, welcome you all here today uh, for this DDU organised event. Uh, and I'm very honoured to have been asked by DDU to help chair this uh, event. Um, the title of this event is, Is the UK Systematically Racist? And I think this follows on from the Runnymede Trust's recent submission to the United Nations International Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And the trust submission concludes that Britain has failed to meet its uh, obligations and is, quote, deliberately rigged against ethnic minorities, and that racism is systemic in England and it impacts the enjoyment of rights of BME groups. Um, so I guess the tension that animates this discussion is really uh, those kind of conclusions stand in quite strong contrast to the findings of, for example, the recent SAIL report, and we're honoured to have one of the uh, commissioners on this panel with us today and also the broader opinion polling and the data from the Office of National Statistics. So I guess that's the puzzle really that we want to sort of examine today. And that is, how is it possible to have such divergent positions on questions of race, identity and equality in our multi-ethnic multi democracy? Uh, in terms of the format today, uh, I'll, be, I'll be the chair, but I think what we'll do is we'll have uh, the panelists, each panelist will make introductory statements of about five minutes each, and then around about uh, 6.30, we'll have uh, a panelist discussion, a kind of free flow discussion to some extent amongst the panelists to draw out some of the themes and questions, etc. And then at seven o'clock, uh, running to a maximum of one hour until eight o'clock, we'll have uh, audience questions and answers. Um, so that's the broad format that we'll follow today. Uh, in terms of our panelists, we've got a fantastic and esteemed panel here. Um, so um, the, the first um, individual we have on is Rakhir Basan who is uh, an independent researcher on community uh, cohesion. His um, PhD investigated the effects of social integration on British ethnic minorities. And he's written for a, a number of leading publications such as The Telegraph, The Spectator, uh, et cetera, um, and often on the media to discuss these issues uh, and especially around the issues of racial equality. Secondly, we have um, Ike. Uh, uh, he, Ike is a practicing architect, author, and award-winning critic, and is the newly appointed senior fellow for architecture and urban space at Policy Exchange. Uh, he has written a number of books on architecture and ha has had cultural and opinion pieces published in The Telegraph and elsewhere. He is also the founder of London Architectural Walks. Unfortunately, I don't have a website for that, but I'm sure it has a website. So look that up, it sounds fascinating. Uh, and this is London's original architectural guided walks provider, and he also stood as a parliamentary candidate in the 2019 UK general election. We then have Alka. Dr. Alka uh, uh, Segal Cuthbert is a founding signatory uh, of uh, DDU and head of education strategy at Don't Divide Us. She's also the co-author of What Schools, What Should Schools Teach and Writes for numerous academic and professional publications. Uh, finally, we have uh, Hun Lei, who is the director at Voices for Change England, a black, Asian and minority ethnic charity and infra infrastructure support body. He's also the founder of the Camden Black History Forum, and sits on the programming board of South Bank's BFI's African Odyssey. He was a co-opted member of the Commission, uh, uh, of the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities. Um, just, I just as also, also should say, we did we did invite the did you did invite the Runnymede Trust um, uh, onto this panel, um, but unfortunately, no one was available. Uh, I guess given the time of the year and maybe the shortness of it, but um, nobody was available. But, um, I, uh, but obviously, did you hope to have these discussions in the future with with people from the Runnymede Trust, which I'm sure will be very fascinating and interesting. Quick housekeeping notes. Um, I should always say I should. should Please look up DDU, don'tdividus.com, subscribe, donate, leave some money in your will, whatever you want to do, don'tdividus.com. Please, please, please do check them out. They're fantastic. Audience questions. We're looking forward, obviously, to hearing from the audience. If you'd like to ask the panel a question, you can type it in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Alternatively, if you'd like to ask a question live, then you can raise your hand using the icon at the bottom of your screen. And then when we come to the Q&A section, you'll be unmuted. Please keep your questions short and on topic. Uh, and I should also say that this whole session is being recorded 
so please note that this webinar has been recorded and that if you ask a question live, your name and face may be vis visible. So um, that's the housekeeping element to it. So I'm on time. And so five minutes or so for each panelist now until about um, uh, 6.30, five minutes each individual presentation. And then we'll have a, a half an hour of a free flow discussion from 6.30 onwards. So I think I'll hand over, if that's okay, Rakib, to you first, please. Thank you, Doug, much appreciated. I'm very thankful to Don't Divide Us for inviting me to speak uh, on, on these very important topics. Now, in terms of the recent report published by the Runnymede Trust, I'd like to go back to the year 2000, where the Runnymede Trust published a report. Uh, it was a report that was produced by a 23 strong commission that it had set up as an institution. And this report was led by Professor Biku Parekh. Now, the report concluded that Britain had some of the best race relations in Europe, that the idea or rather the notion that racism was widespread in Britain was a partisan and skewed view. Professor Parekh also concluded that Britain had a much more relaxed society when compared to other multi-ethnic democracies such as France, Germany and the United States. And I feel that the findings of that report back in 2000, in the year 2000, much of it very much rings true today. I think that when it comes to the provision of anti-discrimination protections, the UK is very much a European leader. It certainly outperforms a number of white majority multi-ethnic democracies in mainland Europe, such as France, Germany, and the Netherlands. It's worth noting that in France, the, it's rigid, strict culture of uh, universalism and colorblind egalitarianism. Uh, the idea of collecting important data on the grounds of race and ethnicity is rare because it's seen as an affront to the indivisible republic. But in that sense, the fact that this culture exists in France means that there's not as there's not that uh, how do you say that policy approach of targeted interventions which can address those ethnic and racial disparities. So in that sense, Britain is very much uh, very much in a better position in terms of its enthusiasm for actually exploring race related disparities. Now. We come to this uh, recent report, which has been published by the same institution, the Runnymede Trust, which now concludes that uh, in various spheres of life, uh, the, the system is deliberately rigged against ethnic minorities, that racism itself is systemic in England and impacts on the enjoyment of rights uh, for, ba for BAME groups, which in itself is an acronym which I or I find it to be a hopeless acronym because of its deeply homogenizing nature. It overlooks a range of differences between different non-white groups which live in the UK. And the report in itself, it almost, it almost provides the impression that it, it depicts Britain as a failed state almost when it comes to race relations. And I think it's, it's quite remarkable that we have an institution where through its own output, is essentially offering the view that from the year 2000 to the year 2021, that Britain has descended from being an internationally reputable model for race relations to a, essentially a systemically racist hellhole, which I think is absolutely remarkable. And it's not the kind of take I'd imagine that many people in the mainstream would embrace. Uh, I also feel that the report it represents an effort to keep the disparities equal discrimination paradigm alive when we have a myriad of social and cultural factors. And this was reflected in the CRED report. You have family structure, community dynamics, socio-cultural norms, uh, regional inequality and migratory backgrounds and patterns. These, th these are the kind of factors that can feed it, that can influentially feed into a range of racial and ethnic disparities in the UK. 
So all in all, I think that this report, it doesn't really consider those various factors in detail. I think there's a number of glaring emissions, for example, uh, workers of Indian and Chinese origin, the median hourly pay is actually higher than the white British mainstream. That's not to say that there should be uh, more debates on equality of opportunity, creating a more meritocratic society. How, for example, can we uh, create, uh, how, how can we rather generate a greater deal of meritocracy in the labor market? Talking about name blind CVs, those kind of initiatives. Also how we can reform policing and improve police community relations. But in terms of the argument of uh, that argument that offers the view that racism is systemic in England, one of the issues that will be raised is policing. But it's very interesting that a recent uh, report published by Hope Not Hate found that two thirds of ethnic minority people believe that pol the police were by and large a force for good and that racism was more down to a select number of individuals. So I think that these are the kind of emissions which in a sense reduce the, reduce the credibility of the report. And I feel that on the whole, when it comes to the quality of the race relations debate, this particular report has not really added or strengthened the quality of those kind of discussions in our country. Thank you very much, Rakib. Can we now turn to you, Alga, please? You're, you're muted, Alga. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I want to focus on the question of whether Britain is systematically or systemically racist. And I think I've got to categorically say no. Um, and the reason is because I think to say that something is systemic or systematic in a society means that you're identifying one factor, in this case race, as having an overriding causal power it would mean every level of social life from government, law, civil service, public and private bodies, universities, schools, nurseries, hospitals, churches, all of it, all spaces of civic and personal interaction would be overwhelmingly determined by this single cause. And I think just, you know, a common sense question, ask yourself, what would your life have to be like if that were true? You know, that kind of extensive coordination of political, civic and public and private spheres is actually a feature of totalitarian states. And I think whatever you might think of the current government and its handling of public affairs, Britain is not such a state. I think the empiric empirical evidence points to a much more complex patterns of political, cultural and social power relations in the way that Rakib has um, pointed to. Um, <clears throat> the other argument that's often used to support the claim that Britain is systematically racist is that, is that the long arm of historical oppression and violence reaches out into today's society um, and continues to uh, operate in the same way. But I think that's, you know, it's, I think there's a little tiny grain of truth in that, but you certainly can't say that colonialism as it existed in, in the last century, in the 19th century exists today. I think what you can say is that certainly there are residual influences from the past because history doesn't sort of chunk itself up neatly for us. Um, we don't have colonialism, but I think we have new forms of imperialism in the form of say structural adjustment plans or transnational systems of banking debt holding, you know, these are transnational arrangements where not everybody is sort of meeting and participating as equal partners. But neither does it mean that all the countries that were used to be called the third world, for example, in the era of East and Western bloc geopolitics, are all kind of remain at the same levels of underdevelopment and really kind of, you know, impoverished and suffering from the depredations of colonialism, this residual colonialism. Because, you, you know, it just doesn't take into account the reality of, for example, some countries have done better. At one point, the World Bank figures were showing that Rwanda's growth of GDP was actually um, outstripping that of the of United Kingdom. Which is not to say that they're, you know, on a par and there aren't other kind of important differences, but just to say it's not that simplistic. And then I think, you know, coming closer to home, you know, we've got the hot potato issue of immigration. And that does affect the material lives of many. And most of the, a lot of them are from non-wealthy Western nations and they experience the, you know, the negative consequences 
of an arbitrary, poorly thought out set of immigration policies, not just this government, I think, you know, for, for a long time now, the most, as we see in the Windrush scandal. I think it's also, and this is a, sort of a, a, a less discussed question, it's also crucial to a question of democratic national citizenship. But for decades, you know, our political class has avoided discussing it in this way. And instead, the whole dis debate has been narrowly circumscribed by statistics, you know, either numbers in terms of the economy or numbers in terms of who's landing where on what boats and the kind of uh, more fundamental political and moral questions. Uh, what kind of a citizenry are we? Who do we let come in? Under what conditions? How do they come, you know, how, what are they coming into? All those kinds of things have been kind of pushed to the margins of debate if, if they're there at all. And I think the really coming to an end now, the really annoying thing for me is that this kind of assertion that the UK is systematically racist is sort of part of an emerging form of elite cultural politics and it obscures the underlying material reality and it makes very difficult to have kind of open good faith discussions um, about issues like this rather than kind of position mongering as either sympathetic goodies or heartless baddies. And I mean, there's something, for me, there's something really, really odd about an ideological outlook that on the one hand calls for open or as near possible open borders and, you know, kind of almost um, sacralizes immigrants and at the same time insists that the place that immigrants are coming into through any border, whether it's open or not, is, is an utterly and redeemably racist hellhole, as, um, as Raki put it. Um, I think it's, it, it, it's very, very odd, very, very contradictory, and um, it needs a complete rethink. Thank you very much, Arthur. Um, Ike, can I turn to you, please? Yes, um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for um, DDU to inviting me to speak. I'm honored to be with the fellow panelists as well. Um, right, so very, very um, um, quickly to start with the question, is the UK um, systemically racist? Um, in my opinion, um, shock horror, no, it isn't. Um, that's not to say racism doesn't exist. As an organization, DDU, we've always been careful to say that. Um, racism sadly does exist, um, but there's a difference between racism and systemic racism. As Alka alluded to, systemic racism suggests that it's kind of embedded root and branch in every facet of our society, from the police to education to politics. I just don't believe that's the case. So no is my brief answer, but I'm going to elaborate on that, obviously. Um, so the question is, why might so many, well, I don't know if it's so many, why might people such as the Rani Me Trust think Britain is systemically racist? Or why may they say they think it's systemically racist? What, 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 why this disparity, it's what I'm going to come to <laughs> shortly, between what um, I'm saying, what we're saying, what was said in the CRED report, and what others such as Running Me Trust are saying? Why is that there? Now, I think it's there for a number of reasons. I think it's there because Primarily, I think even the Runnymede Trust um, is um, pointed out by um, what Reki referred to in their earlier report. I'm pretty sure, I hope they would agree that we've moved on in terms of race relations in this country and we're a less racist country than we were 30 or 40 years ago. Overt signs of racism that um, people maybe have been familiar with in the 60s or 70s do not exist anymore. So in a way, in order for some people maybe to give the kind of narrative, to keep the narrative of systemic racism alive, they've had to say that racism has become covert. So it's all these kind of things that don't require evidence and that they can't be proved, such as the idea of white privilege or the idea of um, unconscious bias or the idea of microaggressions. These kind of weird kind of amorphous um, quantities that can't be proven, but we are assured um, still tell us that racism exists. And of all these um, um, new forms of overt, covert racism, sorry, I think the biggest one, and the one that runs like a freight train through the Running Me Tr Trust um, um, report, is this idea of disparity. They cling to this idea of disparity, which they highlight within, in various ways within the report, as evidence that the UK is systemically racist. Now, I think there's a number of problems with saying that and using disparity to, to kind of automatically assume that Britain is racist. The first is disparity does not in itself prove discrimination. There can be disparity for all number of reasons. Just because of disparity, it doesn't mean there's discrimination. Life is imperfect. Life is irrational. Obviously, we'd love a kind of society where um, racial demographics was represented in every single um, profession. It's never, ever going to happen. Life is irrational. Disparity does not mean discrimination. That's the first reason. 
The second reason I think disparity is a bit of a smokescreen is because um, disparity, when you apply it, when you, when you get a system where there isn't disparity, it doesn't necessarily mean that people stop accusing you of being racist, such as the US police force is around 12%, um, has 12% of the US police force is black which is perfectly a kind of demographic representation of the fact that around 12% of the US population is also black. So there you go, you've got no disparity, perfect alignment between demographic representation and the police, but you'll be you struggle to find anybody who would use the kind of US model of policing and ex as an example of racism being sold. So disparity in many ways is a smoke screen. Um, the third reason why I think it's dangerous to go on about disparity is because, and the report does this very well, it glosses over the inconvenient disparities that kind of punctuate this narrative of systemic racism, such as the fact that um, um, children on um, African, children of black African heritage on free school meals are, I think it's something more than twice as likely to go to university as uh, children of a Caribbean heritage on free school um, meals. They're both black. If we have this systemic racism, surely they'd both be impoverished to the same degree, but that doesn't happen. So disparity or kind of the, the, the kind of using disparity as a kind of hammer blow to say this is racism, it doesn't work. But the fourth and possibly the most important reason why disparity is dangerous to say that we're systemically racist is because if you say that um, disparity alone means racism, what you're doing is you're glossing over, as Rakeem referred to, all the other potential societal, cultural, political, economic factors which may be causing disparity and you're just going to racism. So what does that do? It means that the real reasons that are causing those disparities are suppressed and they're never addressed, which in turn makes the grievance and resentment and racism worse. So it's a kind of hamster wheel of resentment and grievance from which there's no, um, there's no reprieve. And as I say, I think we just need a more nuanced and intelligent approach than just saying, oh, there's disparities, that means discrimination, because it can be there for a whole number of reasons. And just to conclude very briefly, um, I know anecdotes are of limited um, evidential value, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention one here. Um, one, of my, um, one of my hobbies is I'm a campanologist. Um, a campanologist is someone who rings church bells. Now, I've got no idea, but ever since I was a child, I have loved the sound of church bells. I just love them. It's like some hypnotic effect it has upon me. So um, I'm a member of the Middlesex County Association of Church Bell Ringers, and I've been around churches all across London um, ringing bells. Now, while I've been doing that, I, uh, I've never met anybody else amongst these bell ringers who is black. Um, I've got to prom prom I'm gonna make clear the racial composition of my fellow bell ringers is beyond irrelevant to me. But the fact is, it's my primarily been white, um, elderly, not always elderly, but it's primarily been white people who have been ringing the bells, but they're the ones who, who I ring with and who taught me how to do it. Now, if the Running Me Trust was analyzing church bell ringing in England, they would look at the fact that, oh, there's hardly if any black people at all, and they would say that church bell ringing in England is riddled with systemic racism. But there could be nothing further from the truth. They're a wonderful group of people. They welcomed me. They given me this gift of this ancient tradition, and race didn't come into it at all. So I think we've got to be really, really careful about just using disparities and saying that instantly means um, discrimination. What, going back to my anecdote, what actually unifies us um, when we're ringing bells is the fact we're, that we're doing something we all love. We're a shared community. Race is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what race or color I am. We're all doing something that we love and that unifies us. And I think this idea, in order to counteract this divisive narrative of disparities instantly being um, systemically racist, we have to focus more on what unites us, what unifies us, whether we're a family of parents and children, a family of nations, or a family of citizens within a country, these are the things that unify us rather than um, an anonymous kind of um, statistical anomalies that may say disparity exists, let's instantly say that means systemic racism exists as well. Great, thank you very much, Ike. Uh, and we'll Thanks. turn to our final panelist, uh, Kunle. Uh, Thanks for this opportunity, Doug, and uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, there is much that's been said already that I completely agree with. And I think central to the discussion around race uh, that we're having at the moment in society um, is a, a battle over logic and reason. Uh, the absence of that uh, 
unfortunately, in many ways, informs uh, this report that Running Mead have produced. My organization, Voice for Change, have, um, well, until recently, uh, very good relationships <laughs> with uh, Running Mead, and we've collaborated on uh, research in the past and in uh, developing um, discussions and seminars such as this around race. Um, there's always been uh, a healthy um, disagreement, uh, but never to the point where um, uh, I've experienced the level of hostility and volatility uh, since the CRED report came out. Uh, and so in looking at this um, report from Ronnie Mead, um, uh, logic and reason has what's been uh, informing my view of it. Um, I don't want to um, approach it from the point of view of, of just uh, being a hack and, uh, and criticizing it, um, but I'd like to take it up in its own terms. So uh, when I read something along the lines of, uh, it is stunning to read a report, and this is uh, the report's critique of CRED, uh, it is stunning to read a report uh, on race that um, repackages uh, racist topes and stereotypes uh, as fact, well, into fact. Um, I thought that's an interesting quote because uh, it touches on something that um, the previous speakers have also talked about, which is the need for uh, specificity and precision in the way we carry out our research and the way we develop our ideas. Uh, and certainly in looking at the CRED report, it was very clear that the question of uh, simply lumping um, all um, black and ethnic minority groups together as a whole uh, and not having the opportunity to drill down uh, into the experiences of uh, different ethnic groups um, was central to getting a, a better and more informed understanding of what um, uh, constitutes racial disparities um, in the 21st century. Um, I thought, you know, Rakib's quote, um, which I'm also familiar with in relation to the report that Ronnie Mead produced in um, 2000 and the journey that they've been on to come out with the kind of report um, that they've now produced uh, is an interesting uh, 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 metaphor, I think, in many ways for our time. Um, and in a sense, it's that journey from that opinion and set of ideas to where we are today that is, I think, in some ways revealing of the character of how um, identity politics and uh, a notion of um, the uh, individual experience uh, rather than the experience of the collective actually informs much more of the discourse around race than um, it's ever done. Uh, and certainly um, the detail um, of the report in many ways, uh, rather than clarifying um, the position of race uh, in Britain today, it obscures, uh, it denies, and indeed confuses, I think, people who will read it. Um, to give you some uh, illustrative idea of that, if we look at the statement in relation to hate crime and Brexit. Um, certainly at the time of the Brexit result, um, there was a much more strident nationalism and incidences of racist attacks um, uh, for a very short time spiked. Uh, however, the report more or less builds that into something that is a consistent pattern uh, and doesn't actually explain really what um, hate crime and the term hate crime really um, represents. Uh, I say this because uh, a few uh, uh, occasions when uh, I've been at the home office talking to senior police officers 
and also organizations in the community that uh, respond uh, to hate crime. When I posed the question of, well, how many convictions uh, have actually arisen out of the reports of hate crime, um, I was met with uh, a kind of uh, blank stare and incredulous uh, notion that anybody should want to question um, the data and statistics around hate crime by looking at actual convictions. Uh, it is important that when we talk about um, a rise in hate crime, that that statistic is qualified and substantiated. But again, the question of logic and reason, the absence of it dictates that anybody can actually announce an increase in hate crime without qualification. Uh, in terms of looking at uh, conviction rates. And so whether hate crime is going up and down, for me, still remains a mystery because I cannot get that data. Um, so this report does not actually explain that. It simply asserts it, just as so many have. Secondly, the question of ethnicity and looking at ethnic groups, um, I think actually Cred has begun to win that argument. Uh, yesterday, I spent time with uh, Barrel Cadbury, who uh, have a piece of work at the moment looking at the poverty premium. The poverty premium is trying to actually isolate those factors which determine uh, impoverishment uh, in local communities. Uh, and one of the interesting things that it was looking at was insurance premiums, which uh, lends itself to the fact that if you live in a more Im impoverished area, the level of your premiums that you pay tend to be higher than those who live in wealthier areas. So by virtue of the fact that a sizable uh, slice of, for want of a better term, BAME communities also reside in areas uh, of, uh, uh, of low income and impoverishment, Insurance premiums therefore tend to be the highest. Now, you could argue that the uh, if you, you were looking at that flat, flat on, that insurance companies are racist. Or you can look at it that actually, by virtue of the fact that people live in areas of, uh, of poverty, the premiums that they are going to pay are going to be higher because of the nature of the way poverty itself uh, works itself out in society. So is the problem that you eliminate racism or is the problem that you will eliminate the disparity as people have, have said previously through the addressing the question of uh, how uh, uh, areas are actually evaluated for the premiums that they have to pay. So it's not always driven by race, but an actuary determines um, the level of premium obviously on the basis of risk. So there are factors which um, relate to uh, 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 questions of racial disparity, which has been indicated, have a, a little to do with race. They are to do with other factors that come into that. And if we're serious about um, really trying to isolate what determines um, differences in how uh, social groupings experience the world, we have to be precise in terms of our ability to understand that. This report unfortunately does not do that. Um, instead, it sets out to um, smear and to undermine uh, those people who are saying, do you know what? We need a, 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 a wider set of tools to be able to understand the world. And uh, are you willing to actually join us in that? What Running Me is saying is no. And I think that the, the hamster wheel analysis that's been given I think is, is, is accurate. Uh, and certainly, um, in the, hopefully in the discussion, we'll go into more detail because I have other examples that I can draw on in terms of illustrating that. Um, I'm also, uh, apart from being a, a co-opted commissioner, uh, I'm also on the Windrush work group. Uh, and so uh, I know about the changes um, that have been made in terms of addressing uh, the Windrush scandal and the detail of that. Uh, which again is inaccurately um, reported in this report. Indeed, I'd even go as far as to say that some of the areas of the report are ancient history and it's a rehash of stuff that they've not really seriously looked at in depth. Um, and, and a respected 
um, research organization like Runnymede, I think has decided to become um, uh, really a, 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 a campaigning organization, but a campaigning uh, around a campaign around a flawed idea of what anti-racism uh, constitutes itself to be um, in the 21st century. Thank you very much for that. That was absolutely set of fascinating presentations. I think what we have now about 25 minutes or so uh, for sort of more of a free flow discussion amongst the panelists. Uh, and then uh, we'll move over to uh, questions that from our, um, our, our audience around about seven o'clock. Um, but just, just, just to sort of then just to sort of try tie some of this, these, these elements together and, and maybe sort of generate some, 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 uh, some avenues of thought here. And I say this, but I know the, nobody from the Running Me Trust is here. And I don't think it's not about DDU versus the Running Me Trust. This is ultimately about advancing uh, debates and our knowledge on these crucial issues of equality, uh, identity, and uh, race in a multi-ethnic democracy like the United Kingdom. Um, but, it, it, but in terms of like tying some of the commonalities that seem to come out of the various presentations, the first one that struck me was you, nobody's denying racism per se, but, but individual instances of racism doesn't necessarily equate to a systemic process of racism itself, right? So you, you can have individual you, somebody could burgle a house, but it doesn't mean the entire neighborhood is characterized by crime, you know? So it's basically, you can have individual instances, idiots and racists, et cetera, that we should utterly condemn, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a, that doesn't prove necessarily the existence of the system. That seemed to be, to come out of all the presentations. The second thing that really struck me from listening to the various presentations, and this, this, this was, I think all, all four made, made this point, and it really struck me was, the um, disparity, if we, if we have a differential outcome for a, for a specific group, we have to ultimately control the, the, a, a whole range of variables that may explain that, that outcome, right? Um, and, and, so, and, and race may well be one of those, those variables, but, it, but, um, but I think that we also have to control for, for example, um, education and education, uh, social economic background, cultural values, family structure, and, and those kinds of things. So that that seemed to come out out, out from the from the various presentations too. In other words, disparities do not necessarily equal discrimination. And I'd, I'd like to push the panelists a bit more on that as well, because it strikes me that when we're looking at this, we we tend to be overly focused on negative um, disparities, and therefore we miss the positive disparities. I think um, Ike mentioned, for example really stood out to me, the differential exclusion rates uh, and progression rates of um, black African uh, um, young people and, and black Caribbean young people. And that, that, then, that then tells a very interesting story, does it not, about the, um, the kind of the, the British black population. And, and so if, if we are seeing these, these, these um, differential outcomes um, uh, amongst these various groups. How, how then do we explain that? And also, how then do we capture the, the positives as well? So if some are, are doing really well, what, how then do we capture that? The third element that really struck me as well, I think Rakib mentioned this, is this shift from, um, from highly overt forms of racism that we may have seen in particular I mean, I remember the British National Party when I was a young man, it was very strong marching against them in the whopping um, turn to a riot, I won't go into all, all that, but that was a, you know, anyway, I remember back in the day, and I'm sure, you know, many others as well, very overt forms and organized racist parties. We don't seem to see that now, but we do seem to have a shift, and I think I mentioned it too, from this kind of overt racism to, to, to now an emphasis on, on sort of subjectivity and emotion uh, in terms of essentially, I feel it, and, and, and therefore it must be true. So I think microaggressions, unconscious bias, etc. And so that, that that then strikes me, and it, this came out of the presentations too. That, that is there is uh, this is something I'm asking the panelists: is, is there a kind of like a, a danger in that, insofar as it's it almost becomes kind of like thought policy, if you see what I mean? It's like a sort of a, 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 an Orwellian element introduced now into our culture where we go, racism becomes the kind of the key metric through which um, thought and emotion are policed to the extent, and we, you know, where sub elements of subjective harassment in the workplace 
can literally be you don't look at somebody in, in the eye or somebody doesn't receive an email. These are actually recorded instances in law, you know, and they've been taken to employment tribunals. So, uh, so that's interesting then, isn't it, in terms of how we go from overt to covert and the subjectivization and the emotionalization around these questions in terms of this kind of alleged or maybe existing covert forms of, of, of racism. It's kind of almost in, in the eye of the beholder. Um, the, the other interesting element, and Alka touched upon this as well, and, I, and, and I, we've got a question lined up a bit later on that draws us, hopefully draws us out too. And you, I think Alka, you mentioned this, and I thought it was really interesting in terms of you sort of suggested that race on these debates about race now within elite discourse almost are used and they kind of supplant um, a kind of a, an emphasis on, on socioeconomic or even class as, 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 a, as a form of, of oppression or as a form of, of, of disadvantage. So in, in some senses, Alka, you seem to suggest that these, these, these debates now are almost like a new elite moral economy where race has become this kind of, um, I guess one kind of mentions of but almost like a secular religion, whereby kind of post or liberal institutions re-energize themselves as moral actors through adopting a kind of savior type, type way. And therefore, so do you see what I mean? Without having to say to deal with some of the deeper contradictions that you mentioned, Alka. So I thought that was a really interesting point. And I'll, and I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet in a second, but the, the final thing is, is this, in, in terms of the running me then, and, 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 and this kind of these various debates, how then, I mean, this is quite a broad question, how then do we explain the continuity of these narratives? I mean, if, if you put it in very crude terms, the panelists say one thing, but obviously the running me have their position. So, so then, if we, how then to explain the continuity? Isn't it? What, what's if 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 the data says one thing, but we still have a very strong continuity of it of this of, of a counter narrative in the in the kind of media, etc. How do we explain those continuities? Um, so that that's just sort of some of the, the sort of key ideas and commonalities that I took from, from, the, from the various presentations. So if we have now about 15 or 20 minutes or so, and then we'll, at seven o'clock, we'll go over to our, to our audience. We're patient and waiting and have a range of excellent questions. So I'll just open the floor up. Okay. Um, well, can I come back, uh, Doug, on the point that you raised about the point I made about it being an elite ideology? Um, I think there is a, some very interesting work looking at this now. And there's this, there's this idea of, um, I think, I can't remember where I came across it now, uh, luxury beliefs, <laughs> which is, um, uh, it's a kind of, it's kind of, you know, new emergence so, from sociology, this analysis. I mean, when you're talking, there's this idea at the minute, you know, is it race or is it, or is it class, one or t'other? Um, and I think that that kind of misses something really important, which is that, um, you know, we still have capitalism, right? That hasn't gone away. Uh, Class is there's no fixed form for class politics, right? And in fact, Marx, when he came when he described class, it was not his starting point, it was the end point of his. He was looking at, you know, kind of how what made society tick, what made it work. Um, and so there's no fixed form. So the kind of cultural politics we have today, I wouldn't see it in terms of a, a, an alternative to class, I would see it more as this is a reformulation of class politics. But it's a much more elitist one, right? Because the kind of um, compromises that were enacted in the post-war period in Western democracies um, were based on the specifics of that time. You know, the, the, the war and the uh, organization of sections of the working class. And then subsequent to that, the uh, uh, influx of immigration and incorporation of sections of immigrants into the working class. So the decolonizing scholar Kawan Bapal is quite right to point out that the working class isn't just white, you know, it's never been more kind of international in a kind of physical literal sense. <clears throat> so there is something, it, it, it is an ideology that's emerging um, and, and it's often, and it's a very, it's one that takes place not on the terrain of economics or party politics so much, but more in that re the more nebulous realm of culture and sort of psych psychology, which is why we've got microaggressions. And for me, it became very clear in this kind of, in the football thing recently, right? Because for me, it was not about take the knee, don't take the knee, boo, don't boo. So much as who was deciding what was permissible and what wasn't, right? So you had, you had, you had Steve Baker, one, you know, a conservative politician in alignment with Halima Begum, 
on the wonderfulness of the diverse football team and also united on the complete unacceptability of those who were booing mm. and the kind of generosity of interpretation that was afforded to the footballers of course they're not Marxists. I don't think they're Marxists, right? I don't, I don't think Marcus Rashford is sitting there reading Capital and thinking, yeah, I'm a Marxist, right? Um, they're doing it for the reasons that they say. You know, it's a personal gesture for them and they've got the opportunity to make it big on TV. That, that's what they're doing. Um, but, you know, that, that kind of, as I said, that generosity isn't afforded to the other side who are automatically deemed to be beyond the pale. So it's that closing down of, of respectable opinion that I think is very worrying and very dangerous. And I think it's almost like, you know, where, where once racism was used to keep us divided, now it's anti-racism that is being used to keep us divided. And it's kind of a bit confusing because that hasn't emerged in, in all its clarity yet. I, th I think it's interesting actually, Le leading on from um, Alka's point, and something you mentioned as well, Doug, about this, um, I think Alka's point leads into um, this idea of um, racism once being covert and now being more, or at least being, we're told it's more of a kind of overt operation. And, and I think this, this kind of internalization of um, racism and also thought processes is something that I think we're seeing not just with racism, but we're seeing it throughout society. This kind of greater scrutiny of what you think, what you say or what you do is um, of, of moderate interest, but people seem to be really interested in what you think these days. And it's led to a kind of intellectual division, which I think we see all across society. I think you could maybe say, um, in Scotland, 2014, the Scottish referendum, that was probably, that was a divisive kind of um, 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 political intervention whereby what you think became really important. Um, we've seen that carry on through Brexit too. Obviously we've had all the division of Brexit, whichever side you stand on. And something else that came from that too, as well as what you think being important, there came this kind of moral censure of your political views. If you agreed with something, it's not enough that you were wrong, that's no longer sufficient. You were evil as well. And I think this all stems from a kind of moral immaturity we now have in society, which is also now seen in the kind of racism debate. It's not enough to say you're against racism, you have to get down on your knees and show everybody that you're against racism. And if you don't do that, then you're a racist. And it's a really kind of simplistic, but really corrosive and poisonous kind of um, moral intolerance we have now, which I think is also linked in with this, um, because racism is less overt, it's become maybe more internalized, which means that we as internal beings, I think are being more scrutinized in a way which we weren't, we weren't before. So I think this whole idea of racism being, it doesn't matter that you can't prove it, you don't need evidence because I think it, because I feel it, that's all that matters. We're seeing that in lots and lots of other areas in society as well, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Mm. Um, I would just add that I do think that the shift away from uh, a, a desire for material equality um, to one where um, the role of psychology uh, and that it plays has, um, as I said earlier, uh, brought a, a degree of obscuration and confusion to the discourse around race. Um, I had the um, unfortunate experience of uh, back in the 1980s meeting um, a woman called Frances Cress Welsing, um, who is not very well known uh, today, but is the grandmother of the notion of white supremacy and uh, herself uh, as a doctor was a psychologist and rooted um, race um, as a psychotic issue uh, within the realm of, um, uh, I suppose, uh, white people. Uh, she wasn't taken that seriously in this country, although she was venerated by black nationalists um, but I remember at the meeting where she presented some of her ideas uh, in London, uh, I was, I think, in my early 20s, but I was the only person in the room uh, that stood up and criticised them. Um, and at that point, I just thought, um, this woman is a complete crackpot whose ideas will never uh, 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 see the light of day in terms of gaining an audience. 
Gus Welsing, I think, died uh, in around about 2000, I think, and, and 11, sometime. Uh, but uh, the concept of white supremacy uh, and its relationship to um, uh, racial discourse in terms of trying to understand uh, uh, racial differences and disparities through um, white psychosis is now obviously uh, front and center of the uh, discourse around race. And so uh, what uh, was marginal and kind of existed within academia, and I'm sure Alka uh, uh, and, and Rab Cube could probably um, uh, have a lot more to say about the influence of academia in terms of um, the current discourse around anti-racism. Now, I think it's hugely uh, uh, important that um, that academic sphere is challenged. But I do feel that at the moment, uh, those of us that want to actually uh, have a better understanding of the, the role that psychology plays in the discussion around race uh, are a bit on the back foot uh, because of the amorphous nature of the ideas and uh, the idea of actually to, to be blunt about it, losing your job <laughs> if you don't toe the line. Um, so when we don't have that kind of protect, protective network um, around us as serious, probably anti-racist, people who are deeply concerned about uh, wanting to see social change um, are quite easily misrepresented um, and uh, to a certain degree hounded um, in, in relation to what uh, we see as it, it imp being important in shifting that debate. Yeah, if I could just uh, add to some of the comments that have been already made. Uh, I thought that Alka's uh, point about how racial identity is almost presented as an overriding causal power is, is such a fantastic point, where we have organisations such as Running Mead Trust and other actors in the anti-racism movement, they ultimately place race at the heart and centre mm. of discussions on very complex forms of social and economic disadvantage in modern day Britain. I, I read the recent Running Mead Trust report in its entirety. Uh, the degree to which the family unit was overlooked was absolutely astonishing to me, because I think that when it comes to family structure and fatherlessness, that's where some severe disparities genuinely exist between different ethnic groups. So for example, we had recent uh, ONS data, which showed that when it comes to dependents up to the age of 15 years, 6% uh, of dependents of Indian origin live in lone parent households. That goes up to 19% for uh, their white British peers. And then it shoots up all the way to 63% for uh, dependents of Black Caribbean origin. And I think that this is something, it's almost reflective of our broader political culture in Britain, where it's very rights oriented as opposed to responsibility based, if, I, if, if truth be told. I think that what we've seen in the anti-racism movement is an acceleration of ag aggressively anti-system narratives which refuse or, uh, they refuse to acknowledge or, or recognize problematic internal socio-cultural norms which can have a strong impact on producing racial and ethnic disparities and and i feel that discussions on racial equality and equality in general when we're talking about institutions such as running me trust and uh, similar organizations it's, it's almost as if it's more about moral grandstanding as mm. opposed to getting down to the nitty gritty of why, um, why racial and ethnic disparities exist, as I mentioned before. And, and this was something that was also uh, reflected in Lewis Goodall's recent segment he did for BBC Newsnight, looking at a range of racial and ethnic disparities, where he looked at household assets. Now, Certain ethnic groups may have lower average household assets because they're just more recently arrived. Sometimes it takes certain groups to, to bed in. It also matters about what kind of re foreign region they're originating from, what the educational levels there. 
what are the kind of socioeconomic resources that first generation migrants come with when they arrive to a new country. I, I think even admittedly sensitive factors such as family size, that can also have an impact on um, household savings and the concentration of ethnic groups in particular parts of the country. Naturally, ethnic groups which are more heavily concentrated in London, fa they face higher, exceptionally high costs of living. And that can obviously have an impact on the overall um, level of savings. These are, it just demonstrates how ethnic and racial disparities across a range of issues that, that, that they are they exist on the basis of a range of social and cultural factors which are all too often overlooked perhaps because raising these factors would be considered to be politically incorrect and unfashionable in some quarters that's fantastic um we, we, we've got to turn in a bit to uh, the audience questions. And I'd just like to remind everybody, if you have a, a, a question, please do raise your hand uh, and uh, you can pop up. Obviously this is being recorded. Um, and But maybe, I mean, just very briefly, one thing that struck me listening to this again was, um, and this is an element I think we, we don't think about enough potentially, and that is how much of this comes from America because if we think about it, I mean, the UK has a very different history. I mean, I, I was born and bred in Hackney in East London, lived there for 20, 25 years. I think at my school, I was already a, a minority in my school. Um, so the, the sort of the, the inner city experience that I had was extraordinarily multiracial, very multi-ethnic. But when I go to the States and I go to the quote unquote ghettos in the States, it's very monoracial, right? Uh, startlingly so, very different to the ghetto that I grew up in. Um, and and but you, I wonder then if you see it's like a lot of this stuff that's coming in here, a lot of the critical race theory that we, you know we've seen this replication of these ideas um, is almost and and it's almost this has been openly endorsed by multinational American multinational corporations from Facebook, Twitter, to Ben and Jerry's, etc., Unilever, etc., etc., etc. I wonder then, it, to what extent is is this? Are these ideas? This is just an idea, you know. But they've been brought in from America, and in and multi-layered and infused on the UK, which has a very very different history, a very different history of ethnic and, and race relations. You see what I mean? So I mean, may, maybe that's an angle as well that you know, I guess we could just maybe have a discussion some other time. But <laughs> it's it's just something I wanted to put out there, and I'm just abusing my 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 uh, chair's privilege here. So please forgive me. So, so I'll, I will now go quiet and what I'll do now, we've got an hour left. We may not run for the full hour, it depends on the questions, but if you do have a question, please do ask, put your hand up. I think Carrie is here who will um, facilitate you popping up. And obviously this is being recorded. So if I may, panelists, what I'll do, we have, uh, I'll take, um, I'll, uh, sort of, I'll do three questions at a time, if, if, if that's all right. So and then and then um, if you just come back and then we can sort of free flow it and then we'll take some more questions and then maybe Carrie can facilitate somebody speaking. So the first question here is uh, is from Richard Allen, and he asks, um, what is a reasonable or useful way to define systemic racism? It's a very interesting question, isn't it? Um, so what is a reasonable, useful way? I mean, what, what would constitute systemic racism? Stephanos Steer asks, do you think that systemic raci racism is a useful way for our wealthy elites on both left and right to distract from wealth and income inequality? So I guess it speaks to the point you made earlier in terms of the, you know, the kind of the social economic elements of this. And Colin states, I heard a woman on the radio phone, uh, on the radio phone recently refer to the cred report, claiming the report said that racism does not exist in this country. Unfortunately, her claim was not refuted. What can be done to stop the spread of misinformation about the, the CRED report that has been widely expressed on mainstream media? So, so essentially, what is systemic racism? Is it a useful way to ultimately uh, distract from other uh, elements of, in our society? And what can be done to counter the alleged misinformation around the CRED report uh, that we see on, on the mainstream media? Um, well, can, shall I kick off then? 
Doug, want to just, I mean, I, I think um, really just to sort of uh, go back to what I said in my opening remarks was that for me, for something to be systemic, you would expect to see, um, uh, you know, a, a kind of pattern of, of, of empirical observable things across a selection of, diff of different um, areas of social life. So, you know, it's perfectly true to say that, you know, legal change is limited, right? Because you can have legal equality, but still have discrimination because it's not like everyone wakes up in the morning and, and behaves and conducts their relationships according to the latest um, law that's enacted, or, you know, that they may have heard a bit about on the telly. That, is, that isn't kind of a, how, how norms, norms work, but you would expect to see, um, you know, a sort of uh, quite a, a systematic pattern of um, dis dis discriminate discriminatory disparities across politics, the law, um, civil life, and in, and in norm normal practice. And, you know, it, and like you say, Doug, you know, you're, the whole experience of Britain just, you know, never mind now, but even back in the 40s, mitigates against that, right? You know, when American G Black American GIs came to Britain and they were up in the north, you know, the backwards north, not metropolitan, cosmopolitan London, they were defended and befriended by ordinary white working class people in Bamber Bridge, right, against their superiors in the Battle of Bamber Bridge. So, you know, what it shows is that we've got, you know, the, the kind of social proximity that's been quite unique in Britain between different ethnic groups um, makes it very difficult to, uh, to sustain, you know, a kind of empirical evidence base for there being systematic racism in that way. Never mind the, tr the, the changes that have been um, enacted by, um, through the law. Now you can say that, you know, people then weave a narrative to sort of boost up the political generosity of the British ruling class, and which would be wrong, you know, because as with any kind of major social development, it isn't just the, the result of the largesse of the political leaders. And it isn't just, you know, sort of totally the efforts from below. It's an interaction, you know, it's a kind of weaknesses and strengths of the different players involved in fighting for change at that time. So I tend to, I tend to think in terms of trying to counteract this narrative, we need to think more relationally, relationally in when we're trying to understand social phenomena, that that's, if you like, the intellectual thing, the political thing is, what can you do? Or well, you can do whatever you can do, like join, don't divide us, support, don't divide us, support other places, you know, find, challenge these ideas where you, you in the way that you can, wherever you find them, I think is, is, is what, we need an engaged citizenry, I think is the best. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I was asked this question um, on Sky News the day after the credit report dropped, and um, my point was that to a certain extent, um, racism in its distinction from prejudice has always been uh, to a degree systemic. It has to be because it's, it's able to reproduce itself uh, in, in different ways and in different forms. But the question really that people are posing who oppose cred is that British society in general is institutionally racist. And that is not, in my view, true. Uh, and that is the question I think that we need to grapple with. What people are now doing is trying to find as many examples and illustrations of how disparities exist and inform a narrative that Britain, uh, Great Britain uh, PLC, if you like, is institutionally racist. And I, I think that the you asked a question about the kind of corporate response earlier, um, which I think at the moment, unfortunately, also informs that view, the self-flagellation uh, historically of institutions in this debate is also feeding that kind of frenzy. So the National Trust report, which I'm sure people have come across, um, suddenly, Everybody um, is in this well uh, feeding frenzy of determining where it was somewhere along the historical line. Uh, they were institutionally racist, which, of course, for um, the running means of this world, feeds that notion and uh, 
brings credibility to the fact that you know, Britain as a whole somehow is institutionally racist. I think that the, um, it's interesting the point that Raki made uh, about that quote from the Runnymede report in 2000, um, that he could add to that, that the EU in 2019 also did a survey looking at racism in Europe and found um, that uh, Britain as a whole had um, the best um, relationships of all um, the EU states. Um, indeed, uh, Finland, uh, it was something like 60, over 60% mm. of the um, uh, ethnic population had experienced racial harassment um, in some form or other. And it was also higher in Germany uh, and in France uh, and in virtually every uh, other country in Europe. So it is not just um, the view of, um, I think, uh, people on the right or even um, uh, 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 left of uh, right of centre uh, Labour supporters that um, we have a lot to be you know, uh, proud of in terms of the way that race relations has been developed in the UK. That is also the view of um, objective um, uh, of surveys and research. So, you know, coming back to your point, the, the question really is about why are we having this discussion now? I think. <laughs> Um, it's one of the questions that bothers me. Um, why not uh, in 2000? Why was it that people were more optimistic about society? And yet I would say that there's less racism around today, but yet we're more pessimistic. Yeah. Yeah. If I could just add to some of the points that Kunle has made. Uh, I think if you're going to claim that a, a country is systemically racist, you're going to have to bring some strong evidence to the table to support those claims because they are very serious claims. Uh, I, I think, for example, the, the most recent crime survey for England and Wales found that people of Indian, Bangladeshi, Chinese and black African origin were more likely to have confidence in their local police force than the white British mainstream. Uh, a range of surveys show that ethnic minorities are traditionally more satisfied with the way the democratic system works in the UK. And it, uh, a report that I did myself recently showed that non-white people are more likely to report life satisfaction than white British people. So, and, and of course, that could also be down to the fact that um, migrants who have um, moved to the UK, they're coming from unstable societies, countries where perhaps suffer from rampant political uh, corruption. So they have, they have naturally more positive orientations towards British democracy. But if you are truly arguing that England is a systemically racist country, I just don't see how that matches with the survey data which actually exists. And I think that while, you know, people within the Runnymede Trust and other organisations, um, they may see themselves as uh, genuine anti-racist activists, they should consider the attitudes and views of ordinary ethnic minority people a little bit more when they consider these kind of issues to, to overlook and to overlook that kind of survey data and not to include it in a report. It, it's almost a case of it, it, that's deeply elitist behavior in itself, uh, in a way. And I think that the study that Kunle is referring to, another country which didn't fare too well uh, when it came to those figures on anti-Black discrimination was the Republic of Ireland, which was notably higher than the United Kingdom. Finland was uh, exceptionally high, uh, didn't fare well at all uh, in that study. And I, I do think that if you ultimately make a country level evaluation, which if you say England is, syst is a systemically racist country, uh, you have to make those country level evaluations in terms of how England compares with other nations. Uh, that's not to say that improvements can't be made in England. I think that more generally the labour market in England, I'd like to see more name blind CVs. I still think that uh, the people with uh, culturally distant sounding names they are to a degree penalised when compared with people who have more traditional English uh, sounding names. 
So I, I definitely think there's a debate to be had in terms of policing. I think that police forces, uh, the London Metropolitan Police, West Midlands, Greater Manchester, even on Somerset, which covers Bristol, I think they could engage more with Black British civic associations and community groups in order to strengthen public legitimacy in their policing plans and methods. But we shouldn't go towards almost the vilification of the police if three in, uh, if two in three ethnic minority people are saying that the police are a force for good on the whole. So I think there's, the, it's all about, stri I think, I don't want to be over optimistic because I think that's anti-English in itself. <laughs> but I, I, I do feel that a degree of optimism, at least seeing the good in the situation and actually thinking as if we can actually build on what is a fairly good situation, I think that would be a positive and inclusive anti-racism approach. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. I no, go on, you go first, I. Oh, I was just going to say, just briefly, just to add to that. Um, yeah, I, I, mean, agree, I agree with what the panelists said. And in terms of this definition of systemic racism, I know this is a, an extreme example, but I think there's lots and lots of definitions of systemic racism. If we want to find them, you could look at pre-civil rights America. You could look at Britain um, 30, 40, um, 50 years ago, where, where laws deliberately disenfranchised um, 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 ethnic minorities. You can look at apartheid in South Africa. I know they're extreme examples, but we have to be really careful with language. And as has been pointed out, if we're going to say racism is systemic in every function of of, of government or as Rakib was saying, uh, as a country in comparison to other countries, we have to be really scrutinized what that means and look at historic examples of systemic racism and see how we measure up to them. And obviously we're not saying racism doesn't exist, but you cannot in any way compare Britain now to any of those three regimes or examples I mentioned before. So it's simply uh, um, a false equivalence to make. And in terms of also, um, this is also going back to our disparities argument as well. If you look back, um, I know someone mentioned about the comparison with America. I came across a statistic a few days ago, which just floored me. Um, in 1920s um, um, USA, you did have what we would all recognize as systemic racism in most, most of the country. Um, black people couldn't live in certain areas, laws were against them, and the ju judicial system was um, against them as well. But in 1920s America, eight out of 10 people incarcerated in prison were white. Only two, if you like, 20% um, um, of them were black. Now that's been reversed today in a time where, well, we would, America's a different example, but where we'd argue the racism levels are far less than they would have been in the 1920s, the black prison population, I think is just over half in the USA. So even when you have systemic racism, such as in the 1920s in America, if you don't look at these other variables, these economic, social, family um, elements, which we've all been arguing about, then that won't give you an answer to the problem. Because when you had all that, when you had systemic racism in the States, you had a very small black prison population. Why was that? Because the family structure was much stronger amongst the black populace um, in, um, in pre-civil rights America. There was less reliance on welfare. The church played a much bigger role as well. So you can't just look, even the systemically racist society, and look at that statistic and say that's instantly racism and don't, under, don't kind of understand or evaluate some of the other issues that may be at play as well. And just finally, just quickly on this, um, um, one of the lines in the report which um, 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 stuck out to me was in education. Now education, we've talked about, it's often a flashpoint in these discussions with about racism and the discrimination, etc. But the CRED report says here, um, it laments the fact, so it says this is a bad thing, it says current teacher standards contain no reference to race, racism or ethnicity. Now, as far as I am concerned, I, I have a, I have a two-year-old child. When he goes to school, I don't want teachers to be teaching him about race or ethnicity or racism. I don't care. I want him to have the same quality level of education as everybody else. And the fact that this report puts in such a line, and there's no controversy about it, it's essentially, it's kind of encouraging all the things we think are bad, um, segregation, discrimination, prejudice. Let's not pocket ethnic minority students and give them special teacher standards, let's treat everybody the same, give them a high level of education, and that's the way in which we overcome disparity and inequality. Can I just follow on from that, Ike? Is that all right, Doug? 
Yeah, okay, sure. Just, um, I mean, that, that was what I liked about the CRED report a lot, that it was very much advocating a kind of, um, whatever the disparities, let's look at what's going to make life better for everybody that is exactly. in that thing. But I think, you know, it, there's one thing I want to uh, sort of really emphasize, which is, um, you know, I think Rakim's quite, you know, obviously it's quite right to say when you're making these big statements at national level, you need to bring evidence, much more evidence to the table. But there's a prior step to that. And this, this is where I think a lot of social research is very weak today, is that the actual co initial concept is really weakly theorized. So we don't have, you have to have a kind of um, a definition, accepted definition of what the problem is. At the minute, we haven't. We've got us saying racism is about, you know, a set yeah. of empirical observable things. But a lot of people, and particularly in the cultural and academic and education spheres, take a psych totally accept a psychologicalized definition of, um, of, of racism. And, and that's the, you know, if you haven't got that clear prior to your analysis, you're gonna, no matter what you'll end up with is a sort of battle of statistics, you know, who's got the bigger stats on this and, and the actual problem kind of um, submer is submerged under that. And I think, and that's a much more difficult discussion to have. And I think I, that point you made is, Crucial. I mean, I'm, I'm a teacher as well. I've worked in worked in schools for, for decades, and it's really worrying because the um, lack of barriers to the almost total encroachment into kids' minds, mm. with, um, very racialized materials. Um, I mean, I've literally uh, I don't know if you've heard about the American school in London that was in the press a little while ago. I've seen the book that has been assigned to these kids to read, and they over summer, and it's going to form the basis of um work that they do in autumn when they go back and it li this book literally apart from having no literary quality whatsoever this book actually um you know it's it, it's telling uh it's addressed to black children it says you know you as a victim as a victim of racism you you have the right to not listen to what any white person says to you it's okay to say to interrupt somebody while they're speaking and say it's okay and, you know, as a teacher, I'm thinking, my God, <laughs> you spend oh. half your time trying to tell the kids, no, you've got to listen to each other, let them no. finish, you know, and sort of try and inculcate some kind of general rules of discussion and conversation. And this is just ripping it up totally. So I am very concerned about um, the effects of this, if this kind of um, ideology goes uh, unchecked in, in, in schools in particular. So I'll turn to some more questions. We've got quite loads of questions coming in. So what I've tried to do is draw out some commonalities and it also builds on your last point, Alpha, and that is this. I think, I mean, if I've understood DDU correctly, the way in which you, um, the, the value system that you, 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 you have is you recognise the fact that in terms of challenging the injustice of racism and other forms of discrimination, some of the most successful vehicles for that have been, have been the emphasis on common humanity broadly liberal values and look for example at the, the, the civil rights movement in, in the united states black and white working together to push against racism and predicated on a kind of more liberal conception of common humanity um so some of the questions like have drawn these these things out so i'm just sort of summarizing it to some extent um but so what we seem to be seeing now though is a kind of a re-racialization a kind of a balkanization, almost like a sort of intellectual and emotional apartheid. Or you just said it yourself, Alka. Essentially, um, if you're if you're black, you you have a kind of a license, or this book at least says you have a license to, you know, interrupt. Or you see what I mean? So essentially, it, it, it's injecting a re-racialization in what is a very successful multi-ethnic democracy. Uh, and 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 so I guess the danger there then, and this drawing from the questions is. Can that take us down a very, very dangerous road? So, for example, I think you mentioned it, Al, when one of the questions asks. So, we have what's called critical race theory, um, you know, talks about whiteness, white privilege, the psychosis, whiteness as a psychosis, and stuff like this. And if we are now seeing this taught in schools with young people and in universities, which I, well, we are seeing this taught in universities, and it's almost like an accepted thing now in universities how much damage will that potentially do to the multi-ethnic uh, democracy that we have in the United Kingdom? And this is, the, this is one of those, if it goes too far, if that genie escapes of racialized consciousness, right, 
where where will this take us where so do you see what i mean so it's a, it's a potentially a very very dangerous game being played now um if we are re-racializing uh, and, and, and 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 spitting people off according to immutable alleged or, or immutable characteristics we're inter- introducing these cleavages in education in universities and schools etc so so the question is so one of the main questions is to what extent is this new neo-racism of anti-racism um will, will it damage race relations in the potentially damage race relations in, in the united kingdom and, and what what's the panel's view on on the teaching of critical race theory in our schools to young kids to young people at secondary school and and the kind of promulgation of these ideas in universities too so um so, so that's quite a broad area. I'm sort of sort of drawing a number of questions there into those kind of key themes, but I'll just put put that out there. So, you know, are are we seeing this re-racialization of the United Kingdom, and is it pushing against pushing against the, the, the common liberal humanity that we've had to characterize race relations previously? And does the panel feel that this is potentially a, a sort of a genie that might escape from the bottle, or what? What? What would this portend for the race relations in the UK? Well, I would say that um, I think the genie is already out the bottle, and I say that because um, you know the Second World War, the discrediting of. Um, racial thinking and eugenics uh, in relation to the uh, Jewish question uh, was self-evident. But today, to actually uh, determine the social actions of white people through their whiteness has become popular. And so uh, the idea is that, you know, white supremacy, white privilege, is the form that I think this takes. Uh, And yet if you flipped it on its head and tried to uh, define the social characteristics and social uh, interactions of black people through a racial discourse, it would be seen as unacceptable. So how an anti-racist movement has emerged that actually racializes white people, for me is an interesting phenomenon Uh, and yet, it's not attacked by the mainstream or even the corporate world. The corporate world bends to it. Yeah. And that is a huge problem. So that's why I'm saying we're already there. I think that's, uh, that's really interesting, Kunli. I think that uh, for me, it's, I see it as, I definitely see how this is incredibly useful for the corporates who are obviously, you know, bringing it into their training sessions and their logos and publicity. But I, I think there's also a kind of longer, um, uh, a longer weakness, and this is where I don't really, th- I don't think it's that helpful to see it as an American import. Um, although obviously there are aspects of it that that are uh, from America, um, quite directly. But that that tends to be at the level of the, um, if you like, the, sub- the substantive ideas. But what what is it that makes those ideas attractive right what is it that gives them traction uh, as opposed to other ideas and to answer that question i think you have to look closer to home and i think you have to look at how there's been um i think you said in your opening thing you mentioned the term a moral immaturity and i think that's that's been very characteristic of quite a lot of public policy I'm talking about education because that's what I've looked at and studied, but I suspect it applies across other areas, which is that since, you know, with that kind of weakening, if you like, of the consensus that was held in the post-war period, the education policy documents that I looked at, which were from the late 40s to the um, early 2000s, you could, I could, this was what first really made me aghast. I could actually literally see the diminishing democratic content of those documents, right? Now you can say, okay, am I kind of fetishizing documents? I don't particularly love reading policy documents, but what was fascinating was to see the range of the committees, the composition of the committees, how often they met, the quality of uh, the reports and the, 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 
the scope of their ambition for a start. So take, for example, the, um, you know, the, the, the reports that preceded comprehensivization of schools, a major, you know, the most biggest, the biggest educational policy uh, introduction since 47. And those reports, um, you know, there were like two reports and they were fasc they're fascinating. Like there's loads of statistical data and analysis, but that's all parked at the back as an appendix and they they signal it very clearly this is for people who know these are for you know policy, uh, people just statisticians but the rest of the report is really detailed and it's in ordinary language and it, it, it's and and they're composed of people which includes everybody from a very few academics in it there's politicians church leaders union leaders employers you know a whole range of people by the time you get to the 2000s the reports are like pamphlets they're made up of committees of about 12 to 20 people who've met, you know, maybe six times over a year or something like that. And they're completely jargonized, right? It's just all numbers and jargon. So nobody can make any sense of it. You know, rhetoric, absolutely non secateurs abound in it. And for me, I think that that really shows that we've seen a political elites either kind of outsource moral decision making to data or they've just allowed dog dogmatists to take the lead. And neither of those are any good for democracy, in my view. No. Um, yeah, I would, um, I I'd agree. I could definitely, and what you've said, um, to, to stem off from Kunle's point as well, um, I too am totally perplexed at how the critical race theory protagonists have got away with promoting what they are promoting without any pushback. And as Kunle said, not, not, it's not just a case of no pushback. They've been supported by huge swathes of society and endorsed without any kind of scrutiny of what they're proposing. Now, I, I think there's a, that we can sometimes overcomplicate these things, but I think most people would agree with the definition of racism that is the kind of um, um, assignment of derogatory characteristics to people based purely on their skin color. I think you could maybe say use it as a general definition of racism and as far as i'm concerned that's what a lot of these critical race theory white privilege ideas do they kind of assign you these um behaviors or influences or impacts through no issue that no no fault or no, nothing to do with what you've done or how you act but purely on the fact of the skin color in which you were born in and i don't see how you cannot look at that as been, being discriminatory and prejudicial. But for whatever reason, it's now got mainstream traction. And as Kunle said, yeah, the genie is very much out of the bottle. And although I like to be an optimist, um, like um, Raki mentioned as well, uh, I, I think we're, we're, we're in dangerous times really, because these ideas are now being accepted uh, as fact. And almost if you challenge them, you're called racist, the kind of casual accusation once again. And it's a very, very dangerous thing if you want to overcome race, um, racism to racialize the debate it's just a bizarre way of doing it and I don't I don't get why it's been done so I mean in terms of would I ban it I mean I personally I wouldn't teach critical race theory at school I wouldn't want it anywhere near certainly primary age school children I mean um, mine's open as a secondary age but look if it wants to be debated in university that's fine you know um, and nothing is beyond scrutiny debate it um, criticize it praise it expose it whatever but um, I don't mind it there but I'd be very very wary of putting these theories in front of children I think that's a dangerous mistake personally. Yeah, and if I could just add a very quick point, I think in terms of the divisiveness of some of these uh, race-based narratives, I think it was interesting that in a November 2020 poll by Opinion, 55% of people felt that BLM had increased racial tensions um, in the UK. And that also included a plurality of ethnic minority Britons as well. So I, I do feel that, you know, the concept of white privilege I think what it what it has the potential to do is alienate people who would actually want to see a racially fairer society. And I think that if you really want to, um, if you want to strengthen racial equality, uh, the, the, that needs to, that, that needs to be, it needs to have that sort of broad based uh, support in a sense. You need to have an anti-racism agenda, which is, uh, which is underpinned by broad based support. 
And uh, uh, the, the issue with the concept of white privilege in itself is that when it comes to important factors which, which are influential in determining life chances, what, one being for me family structure and family stability, uh, you actually find greater levels of stability within a number of non-white groups as opposed to the white British mainstream. So, I, I mean, for me, I think one of the greatest privileges uh, and the greatest advantages you can have in life is if you were, if during childhood, you had a, you had a, you, you were raised under a stable family unit. And I'm really, really surprised that, that when we're talking about various forms of social and economic um, outcomes, so for example, school attainment, mental well-being, cognitive development, uh, level of involvement in the criminal justice system, you can see that family structure has a, plays an influential role um, when it comes to impacting on, on those kind of outcomes. But as I said, I think that all too often when we, when we talk about disparities or rather when our members of the anti-racism movement talk about disparities, I think it's more about focusing on the flaws within the system as opposed to the realities on the ground within local communities, what's going on there. And I, I think for me, just more generally, I'll, I'll just wrap up my point. I think in terms of social policy, um, the family uh, just simply doesn't get talked about enough in terms of the, the impact and influence of family mm -hmm. dynamics. Um, for me, for example, when you're looking at educational outcomes, I think the degree to which educational excellence is promoted in the household could, would have a could play a decisive factor um, in that. So it, it's also often focusing on oh, what were included in the what's included in the curriculum, what teachers talking about, what's the culture in schools. When the reality is the culture in the household is probably going to have one of the most the strongest in, the strongest impacts in deciding educational outcomes between different ethnic groups. So I think that we really need to fight against that culture where you have these aggressive anti-system narratives and focus on what's going on within the family units and local communities. Um, can I, can I say, come back on that a bit, Doug, um, if that's okay? I think, um, in it, first of all, um, on, on the CRT question and then on what you were just saying, Raki, but on the CRT, um, I, uh, I wouldn't ban it, but it's not educational, it's not knowledge, it's a set of beliefs. So if you're gonna teach it, you have to, we have to ask ourselves, do we want schools to be teaching something akin to a religious belief? Britain's a secular democracy. And, you know, that's, um, I, I, you know, I think Kemi Badenoch was right to point that out. And I would urge her and anyone else, Gavin, if you're listening, to go down that road of promoting, of really pushing um, reminding people of what education is about and what our duties are, and you know, to to teach knowledge, right? Not not to um, teach beliefs. You leave the beliefs to a wider range of people, not 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 just teachers. So there's that on CRT. Um, on a, uh, that Raki, with the family thing, I think there's a there is a problem here because. You're right to point out that the, the attitudes to education are important and they have been ignored in, in most educational research, that's true. But actually so too has the curriculum, as it happens. Only recently I've seen the Sutton Trust report and, and they, for this, the first time, I've, for a long time that I've seen in the variables they're looking at, they actually include you know, the culture and curriculum, the educational culture and curriculum of the school. They don't say much more about it, but at least it's there, it's noted. For a long time that hasn't been looked at and it's been on all the external factors you know the sort of um the pay the disparities whether the mum is educated where what is it the dad's wage or the mum's wage all these other things which presumably have some you know do you know have some some kind of uh influence but th then the thing but the, the thing about it you know how do the environment you grow up in, how do your family see the education? And it's not just about promoting educational excellence because that can be really instrumental. You know, somebody's telling you, you've got to do well, you've got to do well because that's the only way you'll get a job. But if you're a working class kid in London and you know you can get a job down the market because you've got family networks and you can go and get a job, you could leave school next week, then that isn't really going to have much traction, right? So there are all sorts of other factors that that play into that. And I think the, 
what you can say is obviously a sort of stability, a kind of um, uh, encouragement and all the kinds of behaviors or ideas that are compatible with helping kids deal with knowledge and learning. I don't think they're unique to just a particular family structure. I mean, you know, it, it, there's a difference oh, between obviously. a single mum struggling on her own with no friend, you know, with a kind of hostile community and a single mum, you know, who has a network of support around her, I, I think. I don't mm. think values are kind of distributed. I'll, I'll just come on back. That there's a wealth of evidence which shows that children who are raised in two-parent households, that kind of model is more strongly associated. And I think that's the big point. They're more strongly associated with positive youth outcomes, outcomes such as school attainment, mental well-being, cognitive development. Now, I'm not saying that this is a matter that if you have this particular model, you're just destined to be a failure. That's not the point. The point is what kind of family dynamics are most strongly related with positive youth outcomes. And we shouldn't shy away from that because that is very influential. Thank you very much. I mean, that, that, that debate alone could go on for so long. It was absolutely fascinating, but I'm conscious we have to turn to our, 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 our guests. So we have, um, to spice it up a little bit, we've got James Flaherty and Mark Thomas, who will be asking a live question. So James, over to you first, please. Hi, oh, yeah, good evening, everyone. Hope you're doing well, and thank you for your time this evening. Um, it seems many moons ago now, but uh, I used to be a Royal Marines commander. I served in Afghanistan. Um, one of the things I noticed out there, um, obviously I served in the Nadi Ali province, which was Helman province. Uh, a key part of my role was supporting the local police force and the army, um, basically take control of their region back. One of the things we ran into very quickly, one of the issues was <clears throat> the army mainly comprised of people from Northern Afghanistan. They spoke a different language They're from different tribes, whereas the people from Nadi Ali, the police force were local. They spoke Pashto, not Dari. Uh, we had a lot of issues with cohesion. Um, but then if you look at the other side of the coin, my, my team were made up of people from all over the British Isles, from the Commonwealth. We spoke different languages at times. We, <clears throat> we came from different religious backgrounds. And because we went through like the hardest commando training, which is the hardest infantry training in the world, all those things that were different about us at surface level, at surface level were just smashed. Through experience and adversity, we were just a cohesive unit and were effective. So my question is really, um, looking at the both reports, there doesn't seem to be any concentration on any, any, any sort of heavy concentration on the armed forces. Is there anything we can learn from this? You know, I know we don't have national service anymore, and I'm not saying let's put everyone through commando training, but is there any sort of good that could come out of forcing people into difficult situations where they have to work together for adversity to smash through any surface level differences and come together as a cohesive unit? That's an absolutely fast, fantastic question, James. Um, and over to Mark, Mark Thomas, please. Hi guys, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can. I just want to thank the panel for your, um, you know, your presentation, your debate tonight. Um, it's been very well received by me. Um, I think it's important for me to say from the outset that, you know, I'm a I'm a black person of um, Caribbean descent. I'm in my early fifties now, and um, I really welcome what all of you have said tonight uh, regarding, you know, this um, argument about you know, our country being systematic racist. I think someone asked a question and, and, and in, in, to a degree, part of it has already been answered is that, you know, how have we arrived at where we are today? How come? And, and, and my observations are, um, is that the reason why we're where we're at today, having this discussion and, and in terms of CRT, C, uh, CR, uh, critical race theory, creeping into our school systems and, and into my workplace where I currently work, um, it, this, this has come on the back of the unfortunate death of George Floyd, you know, so it's already been alluded to earlier um, by the chair about, you know, I wonder if some of this stuff has seeped in from America, very, very much so. 
and and I think it's important that, um, as a group of people in terms of the message that you're sending out, um, don't divide us. I think we do. It's important that we as a group unify. And I, and I think we're in a situation now where um, we're in, in the past historically where um, wonderful white, white folk have, have sacrificed and, and helped us as people of colour. They've been at, uh, at the forefront of uh, abolition of slavery and so forth. I think we've come to a point now where, in, in, in one sense, we as people of colour, whether we're black, brown, um, we also owe our white brothers. Um, you know, we, we need to stand by our, our white brothers at this time where it's, it's very difficult for them to speak out uh, on these issues because they're very quickly deemed as racist. But if someone like myself condemns BLM, which I do, um, it's, 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 you know, it's very difficult to accuse me of being racist when I'm black myself. So I think we as people of colour, whether we're black or brown, need to be speaking out more just like um, the, the diversity of our panel tonight. And um, to, to, to summarise this in a question, I would just be, I, I would ask, do, do you as a panel concur with what I've just said? Thank you very much. Thank you both for those fantastic questions, very penetrating questions as well. Uh, I'll open it up now to our, to our, our panellists. So who wants to go first? Oh, I don't mind. Um, in terms of uh, uh, being able to uh, experience solidarity and uh, cohesion through the experience of military training, I get that. But I think that on a broader level, um, my own experience of it is of being part of uh, a legacy of colonialism uh, and the fact that growing up in Britain uh, for a West African family, um, it was interesting that I had access to my parents' um, textbooks from their school in Nigeria. Uh, now, many of those textbooks were the same books that kids in Britain at that time were reading. And indeed, many of the, the, the I noticed on the production that the companies that produced them were people like Oxford Press. Um, so in other words, they were as well versed in uh, Lagos in uh, English literature as they were in parts of London. And indeed, if you ever read um, uh, C.L.R. James, um, the um, political thinker, uh, uh, his book, Letters from London, it's hilarious because uh, he arrives in the 1920s in London, meets the Bloomsbury set and finds out that he's actually better read and better versed <laughs> in English literature than they are. Uh, and so he takes great delight in teasing them and provoking them into arguments. Um, so for me, the issue really is about universalism. Uh, and one of the things that I'd noted growing up uh, in, a, in a Nigerian family was that the lack of antagonism and hatred in Nigeria for that colonial experience, and also a, a, a kind of a, a strong desire to move things forward rather than look at the past and be held back by the past. So uh, for me, uh, definitely the question of language, culture, and being able to uh, uh, identify what is uh, common and universal is very important. Uh, and I think that that remains something that uh, not only exists within military situations, but in social society. I think we need to focus more on that. And so, you know, the, the, the nature of the name of this campaign, Don't Divide Us, to me makes a complete uh, and utter sense. Um, in relation to CRT, I'll just be very quick. Um, I think it's unfortunate that in this country, there is a certain glamour attached to violence in America, uh, an attraction that's quite compelling. Uh, we have had uh, people killed in this country by asphyxiation, uh, by racist police officers and security staff. Uh, it barely gets a mention. Um, uh, one of the most uh, famous ones was uh, the, the, the case Clinton McCurby in Wolverhampton in 1989 
which is barely gets that mention uh, uh, in the next shot where he was alleged to have had a stolen credit card uh, and was uh, smothered by a police officer and two security guards and died in the shot, uh, which precipitated a national campaign, which uh, I think even Al Alka may in her memory remember uh, that there was a 30,000 people descended upon Wolverhampton from around the country to demonstrate in support of the family. So that's part of our social history, but I don't think um, we have the compelling uh, kind of uh, attraction that violence in America actually has in respect of George Floyd. And I find that peculiar, I really do. But I think it also relates to a lack of knowledge about our own social history. Um, and in particular, um, you know, the way in which um, uh, we understand uh, race too much of it is drawn from the American experience. Um, and we need to start being more thorough and more detailed in understanding what is, what parallels and what's different uh, between Britain and America. Uh, because I, like a lot of people in this debate, I get frustrated by being lumped into uh, the same discourse. Um, and uh, I think it's really problematic and we need to do better. If I could um, follow up on the points that Kunle has made. Uh, another name that probably isn't that well known in the current anti-racist movement is Christopher Alder. I think he, he, that's another name where, if you were to mention it to the average anti-racism anti activist now in Britain, they probably haven't heard of Christopher Alder. This was a man, a Nigerian origin paratrooper, who served in the Falklands War and served his country with distinction in Northern Ireland as well. He died in a prison cell as police officers were making monkey noises in the background. Firstly, the punishments handed to those police officers were pathetic, if I'm being completely honest. I think the average, most people who would actually read into the case would conclude that. And, and I do think that that, for, that, that does, it, it almost, it, it, it offers support to Kunle's point that we're very obsessed with things that are going on in the United States, but we, the, 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 the knowledge of things that have happened here clear you know violent racist incidents um that, that, that have taken place in britain there's not much awareness of of, of those kind and, and that that is a fairly that was a serious case um I, I wonder if i suspect that the fact that he served in the british military that makes some that makes some people in the anti-racist movement a bit reluctant if i'm being completely honest uh, that, that that could be a possible dynamic i'm just um putting it out there but I think we, we can't underestimate the degree to which these, uh, this almost the US racial politics, identitarian politics is being imported in the UK. And I, I looked with great amusement when I, was, as I saw British uh, BLM protesters shouting, don't shoot at British police officers. Uh, the vast majority of British police officers are unarmed. Um, <laughs> and the vast majority also support that model of policing as well. Uh, of course, the, the older case shows that there's definitely many discussions to be had in terms of how um, police forces, how they can strengthen public confidence within particular communities, namely communities of black Caribbean origin, because there's particularly high levels of institutional distrust, you could say. Uh, but so, so really, I think the, the greatest uh, the, the, the advice that I would provide to people within the anti-racism movement is maybe focus things more at home, maybe understand your history a little bit better, um, end your fixation with the United States, um, which, which might be fashionable in certain circles to focus on what's going on there, but it doesn't serve the racial equality cause very well here in Britain. Yeah, I mean, I... I think that's a great, great point, Rakib. I think because, you know, wh whether it's American or not, the, the point is to combat it, to counter it, when it, with this divisiveness. I think the best resources we've got are the ones we have ourselves as citizens of, you know, Britain's society and, and learning more about its history, as you say. And it's, it's quite interesting, you know, while here educators are, a kind of one thinking about you know how to frame Jane Austen to take account of her colonial links in Calcutta. There's a thriving Jane Austen society. You know they still love her books, right? So th there's that. But I think um, Jane's um, Flaherty's point was really important. I think about 
um, how people manage to overcome the to, the differences that aren't that important in the end. And it is, I mean, in your case, in James's case, it was through a specific kind of um, effort and, and, and an environment. But actually, I think that happens in everyday life with ordinary people, as long as and this is something that's very important that hasn't been brought in the discussion, as long as their lives are left kind of free of control, more or less, free of interference. If people are left, are left to get along with themselves, in Britain I'm talking about, then the whole history shows, the historic development, the social progress in Britain shows that, you know, there will be instances where people say the wrong thing, where people might be thinking wrong things, people might be thinking insulting things, but that at the same time, people are multifaceted. And if they're allowed to be themselves, they, they overcome them, right? They just get on with living together. And, you know, my own family anecdote is a real example of this, um, which is, you know, when my mum mum and dad first moved, they bought their first house in a white suburb. Um, the, the owners said they'd been told by the neighbours not to sell to, you know, um, Pakistan, you know, the insulting word for, for Indian people. And... Um, but the owners were so the owners were so kind of um, uh, repulsed by what the neighbours were saying that they sold it to mum and dad, you know, even though they had other offers. And the neighbours at first were a bit frosty, but my mum soon had another baby, and they weren't very rich. She was washing the nappies and hanging them out on the line, and the the neighbours who were a bit wealthier were appalled to see her having to wash by hand, wash these poopy nappies by hand, you know, and they just said, "Oh, yeah, pass them over." And, and she did, so the white neighbour who was racist was washing my sister's poopy nappies. And, you know, they never became best friends, but they became neighbours, right? They to tolerated and tolerable neighbours. And I think that that's, there's nothing wrong with that more um, limited aim. You know, we don't have to love each other. We don't have to respect each other and continually show each other that we adore each other's culture and food and everything, as long as you just kind of accept People, you know, have different ways of doing things, but generally there's a common ground in that we're all living and trying to live the best way we can. But we're not, if, there's a lot of things happening outside the race discussion that are interfering with that and uh, that are not helping, you know, that are not helping that. That's fantastic. Um, we've got 10 minutes left, right? And given that this debate and the early debate was in many ways predicated and based around the credible Let's use that as our anchor. So the, the, the so, and then we'll, so the final kind of question thrown up then is one. I think the government needs to respond to the credit report at some point. So what would the panel suggest the government do? I mean, I think maybe something. But what would the panel suggest the government do in response to the the credit report? And if if, if we can try and keep good timing on this, and we'll end at eight o'clock, that'd be fantastic. Pick on someone. Uh, Rakim. Okay, so in terms of the CRED report, I think I, I think the government, they should maybe speed up a bit and actually, do, you know, just, just start, you know, actually um, following up on some of, the, some, some of the excellent policy recommendations which were made in the report. I, I, one uh, particular part of the report, which I think is uh, especially relevant, uh, when when one considers racist, uh, one con considers recent events and racist events, was that, that it clearly mentions that tackling anonymous racial abuse online should be treated as a public policy priority. That's very clearly stated in the report, and I, I think it just shows the level of intellectual dishonesty. To be honest, that people have said that this report essentially denies the existence of racism in the UK. I remember very clearly, it actually describes racism as a real force. It remains a real force in the UK. And one of its recommendations is that, that combating anonymous racial abuse in the online space on social media platforms, that should actually be treated as a public policy uh, priority. So I think that that there are many recommendations in the report which would help to create a more meritocratic society. I think that's very much in keeping with our just sort of collective sense of fair play. Uh, and, and I do think that strengthening equality of opportunity, especially when it comes to employment opportunities, I think that's really something that we should work on. Um, I, I think that's something that could do with improvement. And there are a number of reports which have showed that, that, that I think the uh, uh, McGregor Smith 
report review clearly stated that um, not only this is the morally right thing to do that the country if it actually has a more meritocratic society where talents and skills are really matched properly to positions which exist in the economy that's actually going to generate um that, that's going to generate greater economic growth so it's not only the morally right thing to do it'll actually be economically beneficial for the country if we move into that direction so all in all i think that it's time for the government to really step up um, there's a lot of talk about cultures and all the rest of it. I'm not, I'm, I'm not um, underestimating the importance of that. But I think people ultimately want to see meaningful policy change and they can see over time those outcomes. That's great. So we've got about a minute and a half each. All right. Um, just, be, just for me personally, of all, of all the, I know um, the credit report bunched up its recommendations into groups. For me, the most important one was the push to increase inclusivity. I think that's the, that, that's the key thing we need to do. If we going briefly back to James's question about the mil, um, the military, um, basically what James was talking about was unity. He was talking about a, a collective sense of belonging and ownership and being being involved in the same communal aggregate or whatever you like. And then this drive for inclusivity, having everybody feel that they're part of our community, our nation, whatever kind of constituent factor you want to create, that's essential to kind of seeing the kind of um, equal fair society that we've all talked about. And, um, and briefly just going on from that as well, I think, uh, this is kind of, I think diversity, Obviously, diversity is a good thing, but I think in a political sense, it's been a bit of a distraction. Diversity, in a sense, what is something diverse? Diversity is putting different people together. It's, it's kind of been emphasizing what differentiates us rather than what unifies us. Yes, let's have diversity. Let's have a push towards diversity, but let's recognize that diversity is not the be all and end all. It's a means to an end. The end is inclusivity. There's no point having diversity if people don't feel included. If you just have lots of different silos with no kind of sense of unity amongst them. So for me, um, the key recommendation um, or group of recommendations was about this push to increase inclusivity. That's the key thing I think the government um, should lead with. Um, well, obviously, um, as one of the commissioners, uh, this has been something that uh, we've talked long and hard about. Um, but um, first of all, I would say that I don't think uh, that the CRED report is uh, uh, perfect. There are parts of it that um, I would have disagreements with, even though I was part of the, of the journey of creating it. Um, my view is really, I think I'd agree with uh, Rakib in the sense that I think that the big problem area is the one of employment. And I think that we need to be creative in our thinking in looking at that. The, the report points to the fact that for younger generations, uh, uh, pay gaps are being reduced. And I think that's to be welcomed and celebrated. But I think for older layers, uh, there are still disparities that do actually link to the experience of racism um, in the workforce. Uh, and so I think uh, making some of the initiatives, I mean, uh, I keep talked about blind applications, I think we have to be experimental. Uh, and even those on the left uh, need to loosen up a bit and be prepared to um, experiment and see what works. Because, um, you know, that hamster wheel that people talked about earlier is still rolling. Um, and we should never, even though we might be critical of um, uh, the Running Mead report, get. Uh, to a point of dogma uh, where we exclude everything that's in that report as being you know, wrong, because it's not. Um, the, there are issues in the report that it touches upon in terms of civil society, for example, um, voting rights, which actually uh, I, have, uh, I have a lot of time for. Um, so for me, what comes out of cred then is a change in the labor market uh, and in labor market politics. Um, that I think would be most welcome. Okay, uh, very quickly then, I'll just say um, about my area, uh, education, which is that 
what I would really, really love to see is a shift away from the whole discourse of education as effective, because that's nearly always a kind of prefix before some instrumental aim. And I would prefer to see education discussed more into the sense of a intellectual and ethical and aesthetic re-enlightenment. And I think we should be thinking very much about what goes into the curriculum in terms of the knowledge that goes in and also how, how that is taught and the kind of school behaviors that can model uh, and encourage uh, tolerance, kindness and um, equality. That's fantastic. Um, we're bang on time, eight o'clock. Uh, I would like to say I'm, I've learned a lot from this. Uh, it's been so intellectually stimulating. Uh, I, I can't really clap on this, these things, can we? But I think, but I would like to thank our four panelists, Rakib, Alka, Ike, and Finley. Absolutely brilliant discussion. Uh, and to remind our listeners uh, to please check out Don't Divide Us. It's don'tdivideus.com. Um, and, um, or you can follow um, Don't Divide Us on Twitter as well. So please do check that out. So thank you all so much. I hope this is, um, we have more of these going forward. And I'd like to thank the panelists and our listeners for their stimulating questions. I know we couldn't get all the questions, but, but, but please do join us again for future events. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much.